Hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. Let's try again. Now it's gonna work. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> I don't know what happened because you were just saying to me, your request cannot be sent. So I don't oh. know. What... All right. Okay, no problem, Professor. Hello, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. My name is Elizabeth Carvalho. I work uh, with veterinary cardiology uh, as well as anesthesiology here in Brazil. All Me right. and my colleagues are very happy to have you here and learn from you. So thank you very much for your time. You are very welcome and I'm happy to answer any, of, any question you can have for me. Okay, so so let's go. My first question, Professor, uh, it's about the the use of ECG on the analysis of cardiac chamber overload. We know okay. that uh, uh, we know that this is not the gold standard, uh, but it can be an auxiliary tool sometimes. So uh, in my routine, I see many patients with the P wave prolonged but without left atrial enlargement on echo. I would like to know uh, if do you suggest in your ECG reports um, left atrial enlargement when it happens, or just in case the PA wave is also bifid, like a pemitralium? All right. I mean, this is a, an interesting topic because there is several paper regarding the uh, analysis of P waves in dogs with uh, left atrial enlargement mainly, and few papers about right ventricular enlargement. So we wrote a paper on T sub A in, uh, um, in dogs with AD block, and we study more on the right side. But if we consider the left side uh, enlargement, usually when you have a, a bifid P wave and a prolonged P wave, this usually, in our experience, means that there is a slowing of the conduction within the atria. And that means that usually you have uh, an isotropic conduction along the atria that is coming from non-uniform, from uh, uniform, it becomes non-uniform, meaning that you have a lot of fibrosis and there is a change in the pattern of conduction within the atria. So in my experience, when you have a prolongation of the P wave is more related to a fibrosis of the atria and not just on the volume overload. So there are cases where the two things come together, but for example, if you get large brick dog, particularly Irish Wolfhound or, you know, uh, Newfoundland or any dog that are prone to develop atrial fibrillation, it's very easy that they have prolongation of P wave uh, above five or, or six years uh, old of age, and this because you have slowing conduction is one of the uh, mainly, uh, usually when you have prolongation of P wave, this is usually a um, trigger for atrial fibrillation. So that's my, uh, my way of trying to understand why P wave is prolonged. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh when we have just a prolonged P wave uh, as an isolate, fi uh, isolate finding, it's not the case of to suggest a left atrial overload. Yeah, I, absolutely. Yes, it's not just that, but you have also to consider that you can have uh, a lot of fibrosis in the atria, and so this dog can be prone to develop atrial fibrillation. So I think it's a marker of atrial fibrillation, again, due to the, uh, the presence of fibrosis and non-uniform and isotropic conduction. Okay, perfect. Uh, professor, uh, many colleagues still don't have the habit to use precordial leads during no. uh, an ECG exam. Uh, I always try to warn about this uh, on profile, and I would like to know uh, if you can share your experience uh, about the concerns of this 
in the diagnosis of arrhythmias as well interventricular condition disorders for example all right as you know we wrote a paper in 2019 on American Journal of Veterinary Research with a new system where we place B1 in the first right intercostal space. I think this is a very important paper because now we have for all different dogs, either brachymorphic, mesomorphic, and dolichomorphic, now we have a good uh, view of the right side of the heart because the, the right ventricle is anterior in the dog or cranial. And so if you don't put the V1 in the first intercostal space, you usually, in most of the dog, when we remember the old system, we put it uh, at the level of the fifth intercostal, fifth right intercostal space. And this is where usually you look at the interventricular septum or the left ventricle. So using this new system, I think you have a lot of, a lot of useful, a very useful tool now to understand different um, arrhythmias. So for example, using 12 lead ECG for us, it's mandatory if you wanna have a, a diagnosis of right and left fundal branch block. If you want to do differential diagnosis of wide QRS complex tachycardia, so for example, if you have a, a supraventricular tachycardia conducted with aberrancy you know, or with bundle branch block, and you want to do the differential uh, with uh, um, ventricular tachycardia, then this, the only way is to have 12 lead ECG. Maybe we can have, maybe there are some questions on that, how we can manage the differential of white QRS complex tachycardia. And then if you look at the P or P prime waves, you, there are some cases, particularly in deep chest dog, where P, P wave on the frontal plane, the axis is actually perpendicular. So you can have flat P wave in the, in the limb, in the six limb system, and then you go to the precordial, and you can actually see quite well the P waves. Or if you have different arrhythmias and you want to see for example for focal junctional tachycardia we want to look at the retrograde p wave sometimes it's not easy to see it in, pre in a six lead system but it's very easy to see them on the precordial so we really think that precordial well, i mean we cannot stay without precordial now because with the new system i think it's mandatory if you want to obtain a very very good tracing Yes, absolutely. I, I agree with you totally. Uh, professor, uh, in, in cats, do you use 12 leads ECG also? Okay, this is a little bit more difficult, you know, because the, the positioning of the leads are very, very close. So as you know, we put the, the first, also in CAT, we put the B1 in the first right. Then we put it at, at the six, at the level of the six left, at the level of the sternum and lead two. And then uh, V4 at the level of the costochondral junction. Usually using V1, V2, and V4 for cats, it's enough. Because the other one are too close. I don't think, since remember, there are unipolar. So most of the time, there are too close. You are looking in cats in the same spot. So I don't think we needed to put all of them. But for dogs, uh, a lot of... Um, cases, uh, also tiny dogs, you can use actually uh, 12 uh, lead ECG using the 6 lead system. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, so, Professor, uh, about the key wave, do you consider that uh, a deep key wave bigger than uh, 0 0.25 millivolts, for example, in the inferior leads, as an isolated finding? could suggest an interventricular septum hypertrophy or not? Okay, this is a tough question because, you know, there are a lot of old studies looking at the Q wave in lead 2 and trying to correlate this to the uh, septal vector and interventricular uh, and so in particularly uh, interventricular septum hypertrophy. And, you know, sometimes we have deep chest dog where the, again, the axis of the QRS complex is perpendicular to the frontal plane. And this is usually when you got a very deep 
Q waves with a not too tall R waves. And sometimes you cannot actually calculate the axis because they are completely isodiphasic and so perpendicular to the frontal plane. And so most of the time in my experience when I have a very deep Q is because the, the heart is perpendicular to the frontal plane most of the time. But there are cases, remember that the Q wave in lead two is the first vector, so the depolarization of the interventricular septum, remember that it is from right to left, inferior to superior, and posterior to anterior. And for this reason, usually, uh, if you have a very, very deep one with a normal Q wave, this can give you a rough idea about the septal thickness. But in most of the time, it's just a, a different heart position within the thorax. Okay, perfect. Because uh, it, it happens frequently on, on clinical practice. Uh, we have just a, a profound Q wave, but uh, maybe uh, it's not a, a clinical re relevance, just the, the thorax. Yeah, it's just it's just the position of the of the of the heart within the thorax most of the okay. time. In my experience, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, professor, in my routine and in many colleagues as well, it's common to see uh, a T-wave with an increased amplitude. But uh, in a normal calamic patient with, without any extraterrestrial uh, change in, on echo. So, do you see this in your routine? Yeah. Uh... Uh, remember, yeah, I can remember different cases where we see tall T wave, peak T wave, sometimes we see metric branches. You know, that T wave in dogs is, is very, very different from human because we have a gradient that is, you know, transmural gradient because we have different channels, particularly uh, from the endocardium to the epicardium, there are different um, ITO channel that change the duration of the action potential. And that for this reason, you have changes of the T waves. So because of this gradient, then you also have changes for the apex to base uh, gradient. So in particular in dogs with a uh, long, very, very long heart, in a deep chest dog, you can actually have a lot of this variability due to this gradient. So in human, as you know, T wave should be concordant with the QRS complex, you have typical amplitude, should have, you know, different um, cutoff for measurements. For dogs, I don't think it's like that. So what I like to see is usually asymmetric branches. So because we have this transmural gradient, so we want to have a slowing upstroke and a fast downstroke. This is due to the different in the action potential duration from the endocardium to the epicardium of the ventricle. But other than that, I, I really cannot see a strict relationship between the T wave amplitude and T wave morphology and, and a real change in, in the uh, repolarization process. Obviously, if you find hyperkalemia uh, or changes in other electrolytes, particularly magnesium, then can, obviously you can also see that. But if the electrolytes are normal, <clears throat> most of the time I don't consider this a pathological finding. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Professor, here in Brazil, it, uh, it has been frequent uh, to observe some breeds like uh, Yorkshire Terriers and Chihuahuas with a normal heart rate, but a short peaky interval, like 50, 52 milliseconds, uh, but without a, a, without a delta wave, with a narrow QRS complex, without a T wave uh, abnormality that could suggest uh, ventricular pre-excitation or without any remarkable finding of uh, isorhythmic AV dissociation. Uh, do you think that there is a physiologic explanation for this? That's a very, very interesting topic. We are working on that because there are some cases in dogs where we have uh, this short PQ 
with normal AV dissociation, no delta waves, normal QRS complex, normal ST7 and T. So we can actually rule out ventricular pre-excitation due to Kent fiber, so atrioventricular accessory pathway. And we can also rule out, since there is a V association, we can rule out focal junction or tachycardia with, you know, uh, isorhythmic AV dissociation. But we, we have cases where we suspected what we call enhanced atrioventricular conduction. In human, there are several studies on this topic on enhanced atrioventricular conduction, and there are different hypotheses on that. One, you have what we call, there are some atrionodal pathway, so you have a direct connection between the atria and the AV node, and so this is gonna enhance the conduction. Or there are a dual physiology, and we found with the P mapping, a lot of dogs with dual physiology uh, in the AV node. So you have a slow pathway and a fast pathway. And the, the second hypothesis is that some of human, and, and I think some of these dogs have enhanced conduction along the fast pathway. And so in some particular situation when they get stress in the hospital, they can conduct very rapidly along the fast pathway of the AV node. And so you have a very short PQ. Because we know that we put the 60 as the lower cutoff, but I think there are cases where the, the, the there is the absence of a real atrionodal conduction, but it's just because you have a very, very fast um, conducting um, pathway along the AV node. So this, I think this is the, the two hypotheses for to explain your finding. And I really think there are, I cannot say common, but I do see them quite often. So I agree with you. Okay, uh, yesterday I did uh, um, ECG on a Chihuahua and I saw it yeah so it depends because i cannot believe that there are too frequent to think that is related to the presence of uh, pathways so atrionodal pathway or nodal ventricular pathway is too frequent so i i believe there are some dogs that have a very very fast conducting pathway in the AV node. Usually it's the one that is going anteriorly along the intraatrial septum and, and then to the his bundle. And so there is a very fast conducting. When we do EP mapping, we can see what we call AV jump. So you can see a change in the AV conduction when you pace the atria very rapidly and you jump maybe from 50 to 110 or 120. So this is the dual physiology of the AV node. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, Professor Santilli, in the differentiation of the wide QRS complex tachyarrhythmias, assuming that we have a high heart rate, like above 180 in a dog, uh, with an AV dissociation and a V1 precordial lead at the first right uh, intercostal space. We can assume that uh, when we have a precordial concordance, concordance, like V1 with the same polarity of V2 to V6, it is ventricle, ventricle orange. We are working a lot on this. We are mapping different tachycardian dogs now and try to do this uh, differential. In our uh, new book, you know, the, the one that you cited, the, in the English version and also your Portuguese version and so on, we put some differential for that. But now we have more clear data that uh, you, to, if you put in the right spot, so the, the most important, as you stated, you have to put in the right uh, first right intercostal space. Otherwise, it's less, you know, probable that you can do something. But if you're using our system and you do see this concordance between V1 and V2 to V6, that's ventricular in origin. Uh, we usually, what we do, we look at the concordance between 1, 2, 3, AVF, and V2 to V6. So the mm -hmm. left limb leads and the left precordial should have the same cord cordance in case of bundle branch block. And then you look AVR and V1 and they have the same concordance. So if you see the VR, AVR and, v, and V1 concordant mm -hmm. and V1, V2, sorry, 1, 2, 3 and AVF, 
uh, we have a, the possibility that it's a bundle branch block. If you don't see this concordant, that's probably ventricular arrhythmias. There is just one uh, exception to the rule, is the uh, right ventricular outflow tract tachycardia in English Bulldog and in boxers with ARVC. In this case, we found, and we published a paper in Journal Small Animal uh, Practice, and usually what happens is that you can have, since it's coming very close to the his bundle, very in the right ventricular outflow tract area, is you, you can have a, a, a appearance of the ventricular, of the QRS complex that is very similar to a left bundle branch block, but instead is a ventricular tachycardia. So this is usually what you have to do to do the differential. And we are now testing this algorithm. It's working quite nicely. Okay, perfect. Very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, a huge importance of the use of precordial leads. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, we really think that and the new system will help us a lot because, you know, at the beginning we, we were still using them, but we weren't very happy because a lot of cases were, you know, all precordial were similar, but because we were placing V1 in the fifth right and, and in some dogs we were measuring just the, the, the vectors of the left ventricle. Yes, I, I saw it uh, on my PhD research. I worked with boxers. All right. So, so uh, at that time, the precordial lead was not put it on the first uh, right intercostal space. So yeah. it happened a lot. Yeah. In the paper that we we published in the American Journal of Veterinary Research, we tested actually also this system, and we found that in dolichomorphic, so for example, Doberman, and in also in some mesomorphic, just like Boxer actually we were on top of the left ventricle. And so V1 was completely positive, just like V2, V3, V and, and V2, V6. And, and then I forgot to say that, and we, and I put on my Instagram some example about the RPIC time. This is a new measurement that we really like to use for looking at ventricular desynchrony. And this is another example where the use of our precordial system will help a lot, understanding when you have conduction delay, if it's more the right or the left ventricle. So I think it's, uh, and now I, we will put just a 10 minutes lecture on that on my Instagram, if you wanna have a look. I think it's, it's gonna be interesting to, to see our work and we, we already published them. And then in the next future, we are preparing this paper on bundle branch block using the art peak time of, of precordial, just to underline the importance. Sure, absolutely. I will share it uh, here on Echo's Batch Instagram. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. And, and uh, can you tell us about your profile on Facebook? Yes, we have a group there. It's called Canine and Feline Arrhythmia Study Group. And we are, what I'm trying to do is to connect as much as I can a lot of ECG lovers all over the world. And so here now on this group, we have around, I think, 500 and something. Uh, cardiologists from all over the world. I got it really from all over the world. And it's nice because we posted ECG and we uh, will discuss different ECG and any of you are really welcome to put ECG if you want to discuss with us. And, and soon we will do a, in, uh, a, a streaming on uh, ECG reading. So we will uh, try to organize starting from May we will do some ECG reading. The only thing is gonna be obviously in English because it's from, you know, from all over the world. That's the only way to, to do it. But um, I think it, it, if any of you is interested, you can either visit my Instagram account and, and this Facebook group. I think it, you, if you love ECG, you can find something interesting there. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so professor, uh, I want to thank you so much uh, for the amazing explanations. I'm sure that uh, this ECG talk was extremely helpful, not just for me, but for many colleagues all over Brazil and Latin America. We are very happy to re receive you here in Brazil the next year. 
on the International Congress ah, of Veterinary Ca Cardiology, uh, promoted by the Brazilian Society of Veterinary Cardiology. I'll be there, sure. <laughs> we will and, meet in person. Hopefully, we will be meet in person. By yes. The so we got already the vaccine here, and most of most people. So probably, hopefully, we can travel again. Oh, awesome, awesome. And hopefully, uh, at that time, we can take you to visit Cataratas do Guaçu and many beautiful places around there. Perfect. Thank you so much for inviting me here, and we My will pleasure. have to other things together. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye. Be safe. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bom, pessoal, essa foi a nossa live com o professor Santilli. Eu tô super ansiosa e nervosa até agora, né? Porque é, meu inglês não é fluente, como vocês puderam ver. Então, eu treinei muito e de ajuda de amigos que falam bem. Uh, mas na hora a gente sempre enrola uma palavra, né? Esquece de falar tal coisa. Enfim, mas de coração espero que tenha sido muito proveitoso para todos vocês. Uh, incrível, né, essa oportunidade de conversar diretamente com o professor Santilli Todos nós, eu falei para ele, né, todos nós somos grandes fãs do trabalho dele e do time dele, né O Carlos está falando, agora é só baixar a frequência cardíaca Com certeza, se eu tivesse aqueles monitores de frequência cardíaca eu estaria taquicárdica assim, Eu estou taquicárdica, né, sem dúvida nenhuma Pessoal, muito obrigada, viu, pela, por vocês estarem aqui em pleno horário do almoço. Muito feliz com a presença de todos vocês. Um grande abraço, boa semana e se cuidem.